Um, I'm Nishtha Bharga. I'm a resident of Delhi and I'm doing a PhD currently at IGIB, which is also in Delhi. It's a CSIR lab and we research in life sciences. Uh, I think as a school student would know, all of life forms, all of living organisms are made of tiny cells. And all of these cells are in themselves living entities. And they um, talk to each other because as a whole of an organism, we have a lot of different things to do at the uh, level of molecules and at the level of processes. So in order to do that, um, organisms like humans who are extremely complex, they contain like hundreds of thousands of probably thousands of types of cells. And even simpler organisms like tiny insects or worms that you see, even they are pretty complex when you look at them under the microscope. So the tiny cells that they are made of, they need to talk to each other in order to actually keep you healthy and happy and thinking. And uh, that sort of um, is an important thing. Unless that happens, you will not be the way you are. So um, I'm looking at a very tiny part of this crosstalk interaction or dialogue, whatever you want to call it. And um, till very recently, we only thought that cells talk to each other through either exchanging chemicals or exchanging electrical signals, like we know in case of our brain, the neurons. And, uh, but, but we didn't think that they could be sending out tinier packages, which are like uh, very, very mini forms of cells, like sending out a part of yourself to someone else, that sort of a thing, like sending a nail or sending a piece of hair. Uh, but recently it has been found that these kind of things also happen. So cells just send out very, very tiny packets of information. And those tiny packets are found to contain almost anything, almost any of the molecules that we know. So we know DNA, we know proteins, we know carbohydrates, we know fats. All of these molecules are found in these tiny, tiny packages. Now the problem is, we know that all of these things are found, but since we find everything in these packages, we cannot understand what the message really is. So this is a very, very, very new field in cell, uh, cell biology, or you can say in the field of signaling. And we call it um, extracellular vesicles is what these packages are called. And uh, there are four or five types of them. I'm looking at the tiniest ones, which are called exosomes and they're nanometer sized. So they're tinier than you can imagine. That They're tinier than you can look at on the microscope also. So uh, since they are carrying everything that you could imagine, uh, it's difficult to understand the message. So to decode that message, what we can do is we can, we can look at these packages under different kinds of conditions. Like let's say, let's say if uh, you are healthy and happy, what do these packages contain? If you get a cold, what do these packages contain? If you are tensed, what do these packages contain? That sort of a thing. So since we cannot use humans as subjects for ethical reasons, uh, we, I work with cell lines. So we grow uh, one type of cells in culture dishes in a lab where they are free of infection and all sorts of things. So then we look at what these cells are actually throwing out into the medium, into the growth medium that they're given as food. Uh, and then we want to look at, uh, then we isolate those tiny packages from there and then we look at what is inside those packages. So that is broadly what I'm trying to do. Uh, so I have done a few experiments with what is called heat shock. So uh, for human cells, 37 degrees is a pleasant temperature to work and to grow. But if you go beyond 42, they tend to lose their balance and they tend to start to die slowly. So that is what I'm, that is the temperature I'm putting them at. So I grow them first, they're happy, and then I suddenly give them a shock, a heat shock. And then I want to see uh, what kind of packages they release. So um, initially, my boss wasn't happy with this idea. So he said, I don't want to look at what is in the packages unless and until you show me what the packages really do. So I had, I, I built on another idea, which was, I'll take packages from these stressed out cells, I'll give them to another group of cells which are not stressed yet, uh, and then I give them a stress again. And then see, can these packages relay protective information? Like, can they be like SOS signals? Can they be like these cells telling the unstressed cells that, you know, save yourself, this kind of thing can happen to you. So, um, 
I am trying to do that. And in the meantime, I, ha I have seen that the cells that receive those packages, the recipient cells grow a tiny bit better than the first group of cells. Oh, a very tiny bit, but still, it is something. So I am waiting for my boss to say OK, so that next I can see what is there in the packages. Um, a few groups of scientists around the world have told us that uh, molecules known as chaperones are also present in those packages sometimes. Chaperones are basically, they are helping molecules. They help proteins uh, to fold better or to fold to the native state. And uh, we know that as we grow older or as we are under stress, proteins tend to fall off. They don't do what they're supposed to do and uh, they don't even have the proper structure that they're supposed to have. So if this can actually happen that a chaperone, which is a helping molecule, it can go from one cell to another cell and help the proteins in the recipient cell to fold better, then that could mean something. That could be used as therapy, that could be used as, um, as a model for maybe uh, countering neurodegeneration or something like that. So although we are in a very preliminary state of this field, this is more or less what I am trying to do. Life in science is exciting because um, it's very, very exciting. Uh, and with excitement comes uncertainty. So maybe I have a uh, one week plan for what experiments I'm going to do. But I don't have any plan for the next week because until I know the results of this week, I would not be able to plan the next. So it is exciting because uh, you're not alone. A lot of people around the world are doing similar things and they have similar ideas. And sometimes, sometimes excitement also comes from opposing results. So what you were expecting to get, you don't get that, you get something else. And then you have to really think hard that, okay, what is it that is really happening? So I like to rack my brains, not everybody does. So I like that part of science. Secondly, um, it is experimentation which is exciting because you can pick and choose combinations and you can try and do different things. And by doing those things, you find something new, which is what excites me. So doing new things, learning new things, and finding new things out of all this process is what is exciting for me.